Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you to uh, Clean Sea for having the European Environment Agency here to share a little bit of the knowledge that we are building around the issue that you're all discussing today. I'm going to use the microphone to be a bit more mobile. Um, what I'm going to bring you as an expert audience is not a lot of the knowledge that you have been bringing to this team, but I would like to frame the discussion that you are having today and all the knowledge in a sort of broader perspective of societal transitions. So we look at marine litter as a trigger for innovation and also a consequence of fundamentally unsustainable systems of production and consumption, which are leading to marine litter. For those of you who do not know the European Environment Agency, we are a network organization, an institution of the European Union. We are responsible for bringing relevant uh, and good knowledge to the European policymakers on environment and climate issues. We do that with 39 countries, about 300 institutions, several thousand people uh, that work with us. We're in Copenhagen and this is what we do. And usually when we show who we are, we show the landmass of Europe with all the countries. But of course, today I'm showing the landmass and the sea mass, which is about 25% larger than the landmass of Europe. So most of Europe's territory is actually sea and ocean. So I will focus on that part of uh, Europe, but especially on the interaction between what happens on land and what happens in the sea. When we frame our knowledge, we focus on three sort of time periods in European policy and three ambition levels. Part of our work is to report on an annual basis on the key Euro European environmental directives. We write our reports on clean water or on the state of uh, forests or on those things. And that's, that's the sort of basic work that we do based on indicators and data gathering. But we increasingly look at the 2020 and 2030 agenda in Europe because this is a much broader framing and it has relevance to many of the policies that have an impact on oceans but also on terrestrial ecosystems and the interactions between them. In other words, it's the climate policy, climate and energy, 2020 and it's moving to 2030, as you know. This will have an impact also on oceans. Eh? If for nothing else on acidification, if it's a successful policy, this is, this is the, the outcome of Paris could have a huge impact there. But we also look specifically at the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which of course has a target for what the status of our sea should be. There is a link with marine litter. Just yesterday, we had the circular economy package that comes out and marine litter is mentioned in it. There is also a plastics strategy in the circular economy. So those things are bridging what we do today in a broader framework for 2020 and 2030. But an important innovation in Europe's policy is that we are increasingly framing visions for 2050. And the vision of Europe's, uh, for Europe for 2050 in essence, and let me go back one here, is in the vision of the seventh Environment Action Programme. And it says that we will live well within the limits of our planet. And in order to do that, we have to focus on three different issues. First of all, move to a circular economy away from the linear model where we dig up, we produce not terribly well, we use it one or a couple of times and then we throw it away and it ends up partially in the oceans, right? We, we need to go to a more circular model. Secondly, we need to protect natural capital, biodiversity, in a much more fundamental way, when we are not doing that today, that is quite obvious. And thirdly, we have to go low carbon. And all three of those, of course, have a close link with the oceans and the seas as part of that fundamental planetary set of ecosystems and in the way they interact. So this is the framing within which we bring our knowledge. And every five years we bring together the best knowledge that we have in our State and Outlook of the Environment report. And we launched that in March of this year. And what are the four key messages of this report? First of all, policies matter. And they deliver when they combine three qualities. They have to be ambitious, well implemented, and well-designed. 
and unfortunately many of the policies also relating to sea and oceans are not terribly well designed and they are not terribly well implemented. So then they don't deliver. Yeah? But when they deliver, they produce three outcomes. One is a better environment, which one would hope is the result of environmental policies. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they deliver a more healthy environment. And I think when, when, when you consider oceans, microplastics, what ends up in the food chain, there is a very clear link there. And also they deliver a space for innovation. Environmental policies driving innovation in our systems of production and consumption. Now, regardless of all the progress that we've made in Europe in the last four decades on the environment and on climate, the fundamental problems that we're facing today are systemic. Yeah. They are systemic and focusing on four key systems. The energy system, the transport and mobility system, the food and agricultural system, and the urban system. All four with high relevance and interactions to the topic that you are discussing today. And increasingly understood in a global dimension, a global systemic dimension. The third conclusion is that the normal model of policy making, which I call the institutionalized salami model, where every year you hope that by a little slice, if we can only move the graph 0.7% every year, we will end up in 2050 with a circular economy, low carbon and strong natural capital. The answer is no. Yeah? The answer is no. We will have to move towards a more transitional perspective. And, if, and of course in the Netherlands, when you mention the term transitions, uh, the intellectual community around transitions is very deeply embedded in this country's intellectual um, tradition. So we need to move to transitions, but Europe shouldn't fear those transitions. In fact, they open up opportunities to be at the forefront of innovation, of knowledge, of new technologies, of societal innovation also. And so we, we are actually rather well positioned to be leaders when it comes to that type of innovation. When you say that we will live well within the limits of the planet, it also means for the agency, this is a, a, a drawing from our multi-annual work program, that I think we need to move radically away from the old conceptualization of sustainability. You know, the three circles, the social, the economic, and the environmental, and where they magically overlap, we draw the arrow and we say sustainable. This is, of course, intellectual nonsense on a, on a, on a finite planet you cannot have a little bit of sustainability in the long run. The challenge is to organize our socio-economic systems within the boundary conditions of ecosystem qualities. And those are degrading. So the space that we have to come to that sustainable society is shrinking. Yeah? And that is, that is the real challenge that we have to do. And when you talk about resources and ecosystem services and waste and emissions, I think that is at the heart of what you have been researching and what you're discussing today. To illustrate a bit what the difference is between the old paradigm of policy making and the new one, I think it's clear that we've made efficiency gains in the car engine, and I know that there is some doubt about some of those gains and how they have been documented. Um, but overall, it's fair to say that our, our car today is much more fuel efficient than a car from 20 and 30 years ago. Yeah? But of course, if you want to decarbonize the mobility system, you're not going to get there by making a combustion engine more efficient. There is a tangential limit to that. The real breakthrough is something else. Yeah? So some people say, well, then we will all drive electric. That's a real breakthrough. It's indeed a different technology. Yeah? Very high efficiency compared to a combustion engine. I think it would be even more of a breakthrough technology if these batteries are connected to a flexible renewable energy system and they deal with intermittency problems. Then you're, you have a real systemic breakthrough. But if we all drive that electric car in the same way as our combustion car, yeah, this will still be the vision from the the Berlaymont building in Brussels into the heart of the city and the Rue de la Loi, the Wetstraat. Um, a grey, heartless, ugly street in the capital of Europe, being Belgian, I think I can say that. Any, anybody who designed that street, uh, I would like to have a talk with them, but anyway. Thi so this is clearly not the systemic breakthrough that we need. A real systemic vision is what is the driving 
force, the set of drivers behind mobility, and you end up in spatial planning, you end up in the organization of work-life balance issues, you end up in very different things. And of course, we, we need mobility. So then you end up, what sort of systems do we have to deal with mobility? And in, at the end of the day, the car will still play a role in that. And then you want a zero emission car, and then you may end up with that engine. But you do not start from the engine, you start from the system. And this is the sort of thinking that we are fundamentally engaging in. And I think it has high relevance also for discussing the topic of marine litter. And I will come to that a bit later. Let's now look at the four key systems that I mentioned and how they relate to the marine environment. Of course, the energy system where we are moving much more to a renewable system. And this is also at stake, I think, in Paris. And on the one hand, you have the old oil and gas, and we know in Europe that there is a close link with the marine environment. Uh, on the one hand, to uh, get the energy to burn it and to contribute to uh, global warming, greenhouse gas emissions. On the other hand, also the oil that is the basic uh, resource to make virgin plastics that then end up again very close to the place where the basic material was pumped up. Huh? That's, that's the irony of it, of course. So that's clearly not a sustainable way to do. Now, we can use the, uh, the seas environment also to build a more renewable system of energy. This is the largest uh, renewable energy uh, facility in Denmark, Anholt. But uh, there are many other ways of working with the sea to deal with energy systems. And of course, if we do not do that, then we stick to the old system, it will lead to problems of acidification, it will lead to problems of uh, shifting uh, widths, bandwidths where biodiversity appears. So the old system is not just the energy system. There is a close interaction with the oceanic and sea environment, the natural capital that is there. It's that sort of complex systemic interaction that I think we we need to reflect on. One back. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, the, the food system. And we look at uh, green chemistry, because a lot of in what we do in terms of transport, but also conservation in the food system is related to plastics. Yeah? Plastic to transport, plastic to conserve. And then you can think of green chemistry as a breakthrough technology because it would use less resources, it would use less energy, it would be less toxic, all of those qualities that you want in the long term. And a, a big company like uh, Coca-Cola has invested in this. Now, my message is not that I think that uh, sugar beverages are a sustainable future. I'm, I'm talking about the bottle, not about the content. Yeah? Um, where this is the type of bottle that uh, is degradable, it's, it's a very different type of bottle that can be recycled in principle uh, endlessly, one could say. So it's a very different approach. Yeah? This, would, this would not end up in the same way in uh, the ocean. And of course, there is another project. This is a, a picture from a Slovenian company that is working with plastics litter. Um, and they are uh, actually reproducing nets for the food industry, for fisheries. And a lot of our caloric intake on this planet is increasingly coming also from the sea. And so th there is a connection between what they do with waste, the food system, and then down the line with resource efficiency, circular economy, and, and those uh, types of things. So a more uh, circular approach to things. Then we have the transport system, where of course seas and oceans are important. In, in volume, about 80% of the global trade goes over sea routes. 70% uh, of the value of uh, global trade, imagine that. It's, it's humongous, it's huge. It has an impact on the environment because of greenhouse gas emissions, because of litter, of waste. And in principle, this is mostly illegal. But as we know, on the high seas, there is very little sovereignty and very little compliance mechanism. So it ends up in the sea. Or the facilities that we foresee in Europe under a directive from the year 2000, uh, where every port needs to have a facility to receive uh, litter. But this will be reviewed because it's not terribly efficient. It's not terribly harmonized. So there are issues there. 
and we need to reflect on how we can make this whole moving around of goods more sustainable, going from do we really need a t-shirt to go three times around the world before it ends up for nine euros and 67 cents in some store, the driver, yeah, to when we move it around, with what type of energy, with what type of impact on the environment. And of course, there are breakthroughs. The International Maritime Organization calculates that about 75% cuts in uh, greenhouse gas emissions are possible, and that's not even counting the real, you know, sort of innovative ideas, either in a sort of, I would almost say, romantic fashion or in a very high-tech, innovative fashion. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, this is high-tech. Yeah. Okay, the, the urban system, of course, wastewater treatment and management have a huge impact on what in the end ends up in the sea. So the way we deal with that, the innovation there, the extent to which we can channel wastewater to plants, whether they are high-tech uh, and large, massive in scale or very small scale, what we can retain there, but also not retain, and that's obviously linked to microplastics and that sort of uh, issue, will to a large extent determine on what ends up in the sea. And we will become more and more urbanized, which in principle can lead to resource efficiencies, but it also leads to a high concentration of potentially unsustainable practices of consumption and production. Okay, but there is more than that. Uh, out of the box maybe a bit, financial innovation or innovation in the financial system, green bonds, blue bonds, which uh, have a sort of very clear link to investing in types of industries, in types of technologies, in business that is not supporting the linear model, that is not leading to actual pressures on the environment. But there are other innovations in the financial system. Who would have thought five years ago that we would be studying the divestment movement? Yeah. I don't think anybody would have thought that in the same way. Who, thought, who would have thought that, that we are actually putting a lot of the subsidy systems so high on the political agenda. Yeah? These are all linked to unsustainable systems of production and consumption. And the recent work that we have been doing is actually picked up by financial institutions. Our report was presented in the European Investment Bank. Yeah? I don't think that would have been the case 10 years ago, that the European Environment Agency would go to the Investment Bank to actually talk about natural capital and not only about financial capital, there are breakthroughs in core elements of the system that will lead probably or hopefully to more uh, sustainability. Now, the marine litter issue I think is a very visible aspect of this unsustainable uh, set of systems of production and consumption. And in our type of report or, and work, we make a very clear distinction between the remedial approach to this, yeah, uh, which I think is necessary at the moment because there's too much of the litter out there and, and too much litter on land also. So we need, to, we need to do something about it remedially. But it's much more important to think in the long term about systemic transitions that will prevent that type of work yeah, that we have to do in cleaning up the mess. One of the elements that we actually need there, and I think that the project that is presented today is, is highly important for that reason alone, is that we are dealing with an environment, a marine environment, where knowledge is lacking in many, many different ways. I mean, uh, I, I sometimes compare it to the oceans, to a cave that you enter with four little tea candles and you try to make sense of it. We don't know a lot about the oceans and about the sea, so research on how this is functioning and how it is related to the core systems which we have as human beings, as society, I think is incredibly relevant. And one of the things we are uh, doing, and uh, actually the colleague who is the brain behind this and who, who does that is uh, Constanza Belchor, and she's sitting here in the first row, so I can take no credit for this, mm -hmm. is that we've been designing the Marine Litter Watch uh, app. And it's more than an app. It's connected to a platform, and it's connected to the legal basis of it, uh, the European legal basis. So we are gathering information 
together with citizens and groups who decide to walk along a piece of beach in Europe and <coughs> gather dirt, trash, litter, waste as a proxy for what is in the ocean. And in that way, we are trying to engage with people. I've done it with my family. And uh, I mean, it was very much sort of, wow. I mean, we never knew so much ended up on our beach. But we actually gather information that you could not gather in many other ways, because very few governments in Europe today are willing to send their public officials on the beach to pick up little pieces of plastic and then count them. And so this is a new way of gathering information that is engaging. And we use it uh, in different ways to provide and strengthen the knowledge base on marine uh, litter. Indeed. Um, <laughs> there have been about 570 uh, cleanup events with more than 360,000 items collected. And you see where it has taken place. I would say this is quite impressive, but there is a big scope for more data gathering there, for more engagement, for more local movements to, to do this type of work. I can, I can highly recommend it. Do it with your friends, with your family, with your organization. It's very rewarding and eye-opening. Yeah. I'm nearing the end of the talk because what, what, and this will close the circle, circular economy, circular talk. Um, what are the top items that we gather uh, on the beach through, and, and what do we know? Well, cigarette butts and filters. You know, uh, we can go down, plastic pieces, shopping bags, crisp packets and sweets, wrappers, yeah? all sorts of stuff. And actually most of the stuff is related to either, either the food system, yeah? and not always to the most healthy foods. I might say there are other elements of unsustainability in the food system, all the fat, sugar and salt that is added to nearly everything that we buy in the store, for example. It's also closely linked to um, yeah. the housing system because it's amazing how much building material in some way, shape or form ends up on the beach and to the transport and mobility system. So these little items are actually the end, the tail end of these systems and the way in which we have organized them or one could say disorganized them. So land and sea closely connected through these systems and if we look at global plastic production and those total plastic waste and then coastal areas and what ends up in the ocean and by the way when I was preparing this with Costanza I said uh, that last number there between 6,350 metric tons of mass of plastic waste and 245,000 that's a broad span yeah <laughs> yes it is but it illustrates that there is a ton, pun intended, of knowledge mm -hmm. that we still need to gather besides gathering the plastic to understand what is going on in our oceans. So there is a big work that needs to be done. But it's clear that the real innovation is here. Yeah? The real innovation is here. The real innovation is probably not there and inventing vacuum cleaners so to speak, to get the plastic out of the ocean. That needs to happen, eh? don't get me wrong. We need to deal with the waste. But the real innovation in the long term is there. That's where we need to go, I think. A lot of this type of knowledge we brought together in the first European Seas uh, report, State of Europe Seas, that we brought out uh, earlier this year, where the key messages are the way that we use the natural capital today in Europe is definitely not sustainable. Yeah. Um, our oceans and our European seas are not in good shape. They're not even in halfway good shape. They are in bad shape when it comes to ecosystemic qualities. The policy ambitions for the mar maritime, use, maritime use are not aligned with the clean, healthy and productive seas, which should be the driving force of the policy. The blue economy of which we talk now, and in essence, let me say the following thing. If you want a blue economy that is strong, you need strong blue. Yeah. If you need a strong, you want a strong green economy, you need strong green. Nature-based solutions, a term that you hear all the time now, it's a complete illusion to think that you can have strong solutions based on weak nature, right? 
we will need strong nature to have strong nature-based solutions. And you cannot do that <coughs> on a degrading natural capital base. That is clear. It's true for the terrestrial ecosystem. It's true for the blue ecosystem. Yeah? Ecosystem-based management, therefore, we think is the way forward. Not a sort of piecemeal approach, but much more a sort of understanding of what the systemic elements are. And in order to do that, we think that we, we need more of a sort of constituency, a movement around the value of seas and oceans and how this relates to the more systemic questions. I will leave it at that. I, I know that I was not probably focused as much on seas and oceans as you would have thought, but I hope it frames the sort of debate in the way that we are trying to contribute to uh, protecting this most valuable piece of natural capital for Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Here comes a challenge because I'm convinced that we have at least 250 bright, intelligent and enthusiastic people in this room. And still I only have, uh, uh, and so if you, if you count this up, we'll probably have like 600 questions. I only have time for one or two. So uh, the people that had a, a, a very short but nice discussion in one minute, let's say, okay, Lars, you have to come over here because we want to ask a question to Hans. Uh, they'll have to make themselves uh, noticed right now. So, yeah, oh, that's a woohoo. I'll go for the woohoo. So Hans, please, uh, I'll have to pass our youngest yes. audience member here. <laughs> he already was heard from. The woohoo came over here. So who do we have the, who do we have the pleasure with? I am Peter Siegel from uh, Stichting Clean. I would like to know why you count only on the beaches and not in the, in the cities and on the, on the land. Because, because the it, no, uh, as far as I know, 80% of what ends up in sea comes from the country. So why not count, count in the country? We do that. We have very good statistics on waste uh, across Europe, uh, on waste gathering, waste streams, Recycling, recycling rates, methods, we do this together with Eurostat, but when it came to marine litter, we didn't have that. Uh, it was a very disparate uh, set of information that we had there, no consistency, and so what we try to do is to use what ends up on the beach as a proxy, as an indicator of what is out there in the ocean, yeah. and we, we designed an app to tap into the new wave of, you could say, citizen science and citizen engagement to yeah. gather this type of information. We saw the app, uh, Hans, yeah. and uh, uh, a lot of people are already with their smartphone in their hands, right? It's a 2.0 event. So uh, please also download this app. And uh, Hans, does it work on any location? So to, to come to the, the, uh, the question of the, if I would be on the shores of the I here, uh, close by, uh, could I also do a measurement? And, yes, uh, because the, the geo positioning is in your, in your mobile sure. phone. Yeah. So you, you walk a distance. Of course, we know what distance it is because it ends up in our database. You gather, the way to do it is you all take plastic helps. bags, plastic gloves, yeah. you gather all the stuff. And then you sort it out, you count it, and you in, you do the inputs in the database. Because we have and the sides. It ends up in our data. The sides of the rivers. We have the. Um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, but if don't don't do this walking in the forest, okay? Because then you <laughs> screw up our database. You know? it's, so it's called marine litter watch, not forest litter Hans. watch. Maybe. Don't screw up the database, please. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry for the language. <laughs> that's, I just said it like that, so that's okay. Uh, okay. Obviously, we, ne we need and want to talk a little bit more. This gentleman is always standing on his chair. But uh, this is what we want to create today, is to get the discussion uh, uh, going on. But I don't want to run out of time, because as a moderator, I take my profession seriously as well. So I want to uh, invite people, if you're still with us uh, during the break and uh, for the rest of the event, uh, ask your questions, uh, at Hans, or share your in initiative initiatives, because I also saw your bag of plastic over there. So there are a great uh, amount of organizations here already uh, uh, con uh, busy with cleaning, uh, cleaning up. Or uh, also, there, there's supposed to be a surfboard in the audience somewhere, and the man who made it wants it back at the end. So I don't know where it is now. Where's the surfboard? It's made out of plastic, uh, but uh, plastic. Bottles? Where is it? Is it somewhere? 
As long as it, just give it, hand it over to other people to see. Yeah, there's the surfboard. It's still, it's still there. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Hans Bruinings, for your contribution.